So I'm going to cover these items to do with navigation. So GPS, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and then Google Maps and how GPS integrates with Google Maps. Just talking about some of the work that I've done in the past and also that we're currently doing it here at Harper Adams. And then I'll talk about tramline tracking. So this is a quite an interesting point. Um, Simon Blackmore was in Australia a few days ago for a big robotics in agriculture conference. And they were talking about robots tracking tram lines. And interestingly enough, none of them had actually said anything about tracking the tram line itself. They were just going to waypoints. But tracking tram lines means that the robot will stay on a, spe a specific straight line. So he actually said on our behalf, well, we're actually working on this tram line method, which is better than just going to a waypoint. So I'll explain a bit more why later on. Um, I'll talk about the robot challenge, so I'll try and relate this to your assignment. Now, I'm going to relate it to both assignments. I know you've got the, the, the really hard one, haven't you, in Soil Hall, is that right? Where it's got to go over ramps and, and things like that. Uh, so I'll try and contribute some ideas that you can perhaps take away. Um, I've been programming robots for many years, and you do find that some ideas work better than others, and then you read about what other people have been doing. So I'll try and um, give you a bit of the benefit of my knowledge in that area. I haven't done that robot challenge, and it is a challenge, I must say, but I have got some ideas that might help you um, break down that challenge a little bit. And I will talk about the other robot challenge I know doesn't, probably doesn't relate to you, but it's about line following, um, although there are areas that, that will relate to your robot challenge, and, and maybe challenges in the future. So we've got the line following. Uh, the state programming, well, this all goes together with the, the, the robot challenges, which is the current um, way that we program robots. They have different states. And then I'll introduce you to SLAM. So SLAM is the current research that we're doing at Harper Adams. It's the latest uh, research in robot navigation. It stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, which basically means you can take a robot, either in the field or in the home, and it can move around and it can map the area of where it is. And using its sensors, it can find out where it is as well. So it's just like a person. You put a person into a new place, a person can walk around, they're exploring, building up a mental map, and then they know where they are because they say, oh yes, I've been to this room before, I've been to this area. So it's, it's all about that. Now robots are starting to do that too, so I'll, I'll give you some ideas of, of how they're doing that. And we're actually starting to make SLAM algorithms here at Harper Adams and apply them. So it's exciting stuff. So one of the first projects that I got involved with was a, uh, a GPS robot. This is some years ago. This is an all-terrain robot, four-wheel drive, uh, skid steer robot. And the idea was to work with archaeologists and this is before I got involved in farming, and I wanted the robot to be able to track up and down tram lines, basically, carrying a ground-penetrating radar with it. And as it moved along with this ground-penetrating radar, it would ping the depth and eventually build up a map of what's underneath there. And if you've got a, a map of, of pings, when you get all that information together, you can see a lot more than you can with just a single metal detector or ground penetrating radar in a single spot. So you're building up a whole area. And my idea was to have this route following algorithm around a field, and then it builds up, you can almost imagine an, an image of subterranean um, pings that would be built up here. But Moving on to Harper Adams and how it relates to us here, this picture is actually taken from SAFAR, which is uh, Software Architecture for Agricultural Robots. So this is something that we've developed on site here. And this is a field of Harper Adams, actually. Well, the engineering block is here now, but this is taken from a Google Earth image. And how SAFAR works is you can outline a field and you can tell the robot that you want to cover that field. And the route planner, will plan the most optimal route to completely cover the field and minimising the head turns. Because in the headland turns, you, you're, you're losing out some of, the, uh, some of the, the work that you can do. So there's a coverage algorithm that works out the best route, the most optimal route for the robot to follow. And it's not always what you would imagine. It's not always the longest part of the field. Sometimes it could be diagonal. So there are different algorithms. With, well, sorry, there's one algorithm with different 
responses. Um, so that's what we've done right here. And obviously, this isn't for archaeology, but this is for any kind of coverage, whether it's ploughing or seeding or whatever we need to do. And with a coverage algorithm, we input the size of the field and we input the width between the tram lines, and then it will calculate the most optimal way from that. So the big, the crucial part to all of this is GPS data. So I don't know if you've played with GPS data before, but GPS data, when you, when you get a GPS unit, and they're usually quite small, I mean they're in your mobile phones, they're tiny, but the ones we use are about so big. Um, they plug into the USB of your PC, or RS-2324, and you get a string of data, and it's known as NMEA data. So the, the string of data looks like this. Have you, have you seen this kind of string before? Is that familiar or not? Okay, so this is very common to how GPS receivers work. They, they start off with a, a dollar symbol, and then you've got this uh, GPRMC. Okay, now that means that the type of string it is. Usually GPS receivers send you about four strings of information. So a string is, is that whole line of information. Usually there's about four that all come down in one go. Every second it sends out new information. And the different types of strings might tell you a bit more information. One string might tell you how many satellites that, that are in view, for example. But the particular string that I use is this GPRMC, which tells you the time of day. So you can see the time of day here. So it's 16, 18, and 30 seconds. So it's a nice way of being able to get the time from satellites. And the other interesting bits are the latitude, which are encoded, 5246.9262, north, north of the equator, and the longitude, 225.7753, west of Greenwich, of the Greenwich Mean Line. Okay, so let's have a look at that information that I'm particularly interested in. You know, how do we program a robot to know where it is using this string of information? Well, all you do is you count the commas. So the latitude is always at that position. So you count how many commas away it is, and then you, you read that data in. Okay, so that's your latitude string. Now you probably know that latitude and longitude is um, in degrees, degrees and minutes, or you can have degrees and then fractions of a degree. I prefer to work in fractions of a degree rather than degrees and minutes. So, you know, we're at about 52 degrees. Okay, so we need to extract the information from there. So extracting that information, we have 5246.9262, uh, et cetera, up until the, the value of west. Now it's encoded in this format. It's encoded in, it's always, the first two characters are degrees, degrees, and then the rest of the characters are in minutes. So it's 52 degrees, and 46.9262 minutes. Same with the longitude. The longitude is always encoded in DDD, so it's degrees, 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 so it's 002, so it's two degrees, and 25.7753 minutes. Now that's pretty useless for me, really, having it in minutes, so I prefer to change the minutes into a fraction. So all you do is you take the 46.9262 from the longitude, divide it by 60, and then add it to the value that you've got here. So it becomes 52.782103 degrees and 2.429588 degrees on the longitude. And it's west, because we've got the, the W west, so we'll make that negative. So it's just a simple way of all of our Earth coordinates translators. That's how, if you plug in a GPS receiver, that's how you get the data out of it. That's how you know where you are. And it's accurate to around about one metre. I can still record this. Okay, so as I said, you can import it like that. You've got height. Actually, that's why those colours have changed slightly. You can see that this is about 98 metres above sea level. That's quite interesting. Okay, so latitude and longitude are all fine, um, but how do you really work with them? How do you get the bearing and how do you get distance? Let's say I start off at latitude and longitude one position, 
then move to latitude and long longitude in another position, how do you calculate the distance? Well, the whole thing is, is based on degrees from the centre of the Earth. So you've got your longitude, so you're talking degrees when you move along, and degrees in latitude. Now, you can probably work out that if you know the radius of the Earth, and you know the degrees that you've subtended, you can calculate the distance, because you can just use trigonometry, you can use radius. But you're working with very, very small numbers because if, if I move from one part of the Earth to another and I want to know the distance, and I'm talking about one metre, it's an extremely small angle that it will have changed and those num numbers are pretty horrendous to, to work with. So there is another method and it's UTM method. So the UTM method divides um, the Earth into zones and it works with, in metres. And this is the uh, American military use this form of, um, of, of mapping of coordinates. Now, you probably know that the Earth isn't quite spherical. It's known as geoid, so it's flattened, and it's, it's, it's not great, okay, to work with. So if it was a perfect sphere, life would be a lot easier. So what they do to, to compensate for this is to divide the Earth into zones. And you can see the zones around Europe. So there are UTM zones. I know you can't see the numbers very clearly, but you've got the number 29 there to 33. And that is a U zone. That's a V zone. Uh, that's a W zone, etc. So you've got these zones. Now, thankfully, we, seem to, we have one zone, really, around England, which makes life really easy. So what the UTM coordinates will give you is the UTM zone that we're working in, so the, the label, which would be, what, 30, 36, uh, 30, 30 U for England. We don't have to worry about that. And then it will give you a distance in metres from the corner of that. So you've got the X and the Y from the corner of that point. So if we're looking at half radius, we've, we've moved so many thousands of metres on the X direction and so many in the Y direction. Okay, so it's a lot easier to work with, so we convert everything to metres. Um, the, the bit of code to do that is about one page of C code, which is available. I've got a link for that. It's not too bad, really, but it will do all the translations for you. It uses trigonometry, and once you've got the distances in metres, it's very easy, to, obviously, to calculate displacement because you've got the square root of the uh, x squared and y squared, and then it's easy to calculate bearing because you can just use the inverse tan of the difference in y over the difference in x. So you've got your bearing and displacement straightforward. Now, I work with the UTM coordinate system because it makes life a lot easier. And if we're dividing a, a field into tram lines, for example, it's all done in UTM coordinates. So I can walk around with my GPS receiver and make a, um, the point of the field, let's say it's just a simple square field. So I can take a reading of point number one, point number two, point number three, and point number four. Or I could just use Google Earth and click on those, which is what we normally do with the, the software architecture. So we look at a map of the, the field and click, whether we're clicking or we're going around with the receiver, it doesn't make any difference. They should be the same values. However, Google Earth is sometimes a, has a bit of disparity. So if you're trying to be really accurate, don't rely on Google Earth for finding your latitude and longitude. Actually walk out with a, a GPS receiver. Okay, so we can create the tram lines from just the four, port, uh, four corner points. And just by knowing the distance that we need between those tram lines, we can divide them equally into equal spacing. So we have software, so it's a straightforward algorithm that will draw virtual lines from point one to point two, and point three to point four, and then it will take the difference in the x direction, and taking the, um, the, the distance into consideration, and then create these extra points to work towards. So each of these points at the headland become aim points for the robot to aim to. So it will start here, and then the aim point will be up here. So it will aim to that point. And then when it gets to point number two, it will go into a turning behaviour. So rather than following the point, turning behaviour until it gets to the next point along. And then it will aim for this point. So it starts to aim towards the point at the end, and then it gets to a behaviour that says, I'm at that point, now turn, now carry on, etc. So it moves in that direction, in that way. We can create waypoints. So a waypoint uh, could be, let's say there is a lake or a tree in the way, so we don't want the robot to go in a completely straight line right through it. So if 
issues in the way. Maybe you're thinking right now, what could be the problem of just aiming for a single point? And that was something that I mentioned right at the start. So there are some issues with just aiming for that single point. And the issues with aiming for a, a single point are, let's say that this is the desired path of the robot. Okay. This is the end point. So the robot aims to this end point. And the robot has strayed off the path. Now there's two differences that the robot is strayed by. It's strayed by its displacement from that desired path. And also it's bearing of the path. So it needs to rotate to get to the, the back onto the point again. Now, as I mentioned, um, Simon Blackmore was in Australia and a lot of the people doing research did had this algorithm which was straight to waypoint. So your robot's here and it's straight from the path. So we tell the robot to rotate and aim towards this desired point. But you can see that there's a big problem here. As the robot's heading, it will, it will go follow this dotted line towards a desired path, but really it's supposed to be doing its work along this path. So the most important thing is that it gets back to this path as soon as possible. It's no point if it just heads to the path and then finally gets there when it's in time to turn, because it's, it's done its work in the wrong part of the field. So we need a way of getting that robot back as quickly as possible. So we've got an improved algorithm that will allow the robot to do that. And we've tested that out by knowing about the, the kinematics of the robot. So I'm introducing you to robot kinematics here. So what robot kinematics are, are relating the speeds of the wheel, and I'm just talking about a skid steer robot just to make things very simple to start off with. And what, a, what the kinematics of a mobile robot do is they relate the wheel speed to um, the distance of a robot, or the, the velocity of the robot, and also the angular velocity of the robot. So if the right wheel is moving faster than the left wheel, it will tend to drift in the, um, the left-hand direction, and vice versa. So by knowing the kinematics of the robot, we can do a simulation and try different algorithms. So rather than going to the field and trying out can we steer the robot back onto the track? We can put the kinematics, and this is, it's only a very simple equation. How, how far has it moved? What angle has it turned? And the distance L and distance R are the distance that each of these wheels have turned. We can put that into a simulator, for example, MATLAB. You can even do it in Excel, and you can see how the path of the robot has changed. And you can write an algorithm, for example, you could say, if the robot as uh, if the angle of the robot is a positive angle, in this example, maybe it's positive 20 degrees, then speed up the left-hand motor. And if you speed up the left-hand motor, you can see that the change of angle will be a negative value, or a more negative value. That's bigger, this is going to be headed towards the negative, so the robot will veer more towards the right-hand side. Um, so this is the, the kinematics of a differential drive robot. Dist L, dist R are those uh, your, your wheel distances. Oh, w, by the way, is the width between the wheels. So as width changes, it does change how that angle works. An angle is measured in radians. Now I've got the kinematic solution for the robot that you're using, which is a Ackerman steered robot. Very similar to this. It's, it's not much different, uh, more different. Um, the difference is it depends on the wheel base, so the distance between the driving wheels and the rear wheels. I haven't put them put it on these slides, but what I'll do is I'll update it onto Moodle, and I'll try and do that today. So you've got an idea of the, the kinematics of, of your robot. And what it will tell you is, if you tell your robot to steer at an angle of, let's say, 10 degrees, and then drive forwards mm, 10 centimetres, at what, what angle would it be heading towards? And what's, what's the arc that it's subtended? And what would the x, y position be? So that relies on you knowing the wheel diameter and really the speed of the wheel. So let's say you run it for, um, for three seconds and you know the speed of the wheel. So it's run for three seconds, you know the, the 
speed, you know the um, diameter, so you can calculate the circumference. So how far has that wheel pushed that robot along? And looking at the steering wheels, well, which direction has it pushed the robot? Is it straight on? Is it bearing to the right? Is it bearing to the left? Well, you can calculate that. So having those robot kinematics can give you a really good idea of the movement of the robot. You can also calculate the, the, steer, the, the radius of turn of the robot too. Okay, so knowing the kinematics of the robot has enabled us to develop an algorithm to allow the robot to, to follow the line. And the trick that we're doing for following the line is called follow the carrot. So rather than aiming towards the goal point, it aims towards a carrot point, a bit like a donkey trying to follow a carrot. Okay. Now this carrot lies on the ideal line that we want the robot to be working on. And we need to calculate the position of this carrot, which is obviously a virtual carrot, we just call it a carrot because it's an aim point. So what the algorithm does with is take the absolute position of the robot using GPS coordinates. You know the start position and the goal point coordinates as well. It's all in UTM, so it's fairly straightforward to, to do. And you can use trigonometry to get the uh, tange tangential uh, point to that ideal line. So it takes a tangent from the robot to the ideal line. So we get our point here. From that tangential point, we then make up a distance of where we want the carrot to be. Now, when I say we make up a distance, we, we do have to, um, to experiment with that distance sometimes. Do you make the distance one meter ahead of the robot? Do you make it 10 meters ahead? Do you make it um, 100 meters ahead? Obviously, if that carrot is too far away, it may as well just be ending, heading towards the goal point anyway. So you want that, that carrot position to be fairly close to the robot, but not too close that, it, that it's starting to try and do right angle turns to get to the carrot, but not too far away that it's drifting slowly towards the line. So it, that's a bit of a, you know, how do we find that out? And I'll, I'll show you what we had to do to do that. We had to do some experiments to do that. Okay, so you then move along this line and you put your aim point, which is our carrot point, and now the, the control system of the robot says, I want to aim to that point. So you calculate the angle to that point, and you need to you know, obviously get there. Now, how would you do that in a control system? So if you've got your Ackerman steered robot, and you've got the steering command, you're not really bothered about the drive command, you just keep that driving at a speed. So it's a good idea just to separate the, uh, the control problem into two separate problems. One is driving the robot. You can leave that for now. It doesn't have to stop, just keep it driving. But the most important in this tracking is the orientation of the robot, is the steering wheel. Same as if you drive it on the motorway. Your accelerator isn't too important, okay? You're just driving along. What's most important is your steering wheel, that you stay on the, on the right lane that you need to be in. So that's the most important. So we forget about driving and steering. So that is the angle that we need to aim for. And in your control algorithm, you can just say, well, make the steering wheels proportional to this angle. So if the angle is a negative angle, the steering wheels will go from the centre line in one direction, and if the angle is a positive angle, then the steering wheels will turn in the opposite direction. That's all you need to do. You can say steer angle is a proportion of this, this difference angle here. You could say that was k. So you take the difference angle, multiply it by k. k could be 1, for example, and make the steering wheel that value. Obviously, if it's too high, you have to limit the steering angle as well, so well, don't, don't be too much. So that's basically how it all works. So how do we know that the, where we should put the carrot position? Well, we've tried different values of, of carrot length, and you can see the different trajectories of the robot. Obviously, this one is too sluggish, so it's slowly turning there, but it's not turning enough, and it's, and it's not steering nicely into the line. But if we have the carrot distance, the right distance, you can see that we have a nice trajectory. So the robot was initially in this direction, by the way, to the, heading to the right along the x-axis. Uh, it should be along this dotted line. You and I would steer a vehicle like this. We would head round towards the line and then scoop up the line quite nicely. So I built this kind of 
kinematic model uh, and this graph just from knowing the kinematics of the robot, just from those equations, iterating those equations around. So I could then find the current distance, which is about five meters, by the way. That works really well for us. Okay, so let me give you some suggestions on the robot. Uh, this is actually for the, the other group, so I won't go into this too much, but that is the robot challenge for the other group, which is basically a line following and, and junction detection procedure. Okay, but I'm still going to talk about this because it does apply to you. Um, what I would always do with a robot challenge is always try and keep it as simple as possible. Okay, so I would not gather lots and lots of sensors because the more sensors you've got, the more processing you have to do. Lots of sensors are fine, but if you don't know how to use them, there's no point. So I would always start off with trying to do it with one sensor, and then build up my programming knowledge from one sensor, and then work from there. For example, with line following, I would use a single sensor. And you can use an algorithm that says, well, either I'm off the line or on the line. And what you could do is, you can write an algorithm where you could say, well, keep one uh, keep the right wheel at a constant speed, and the left wheel, this is the simplest one, you could say, well, drive the left wheel if the line, uh, if the sensor sees white, no, if it sees black, rather, drive it faster than the right wheel, and if the sensor sees white, then drive the left wheel slower. So the only control that you're doing is on the left wheel. That is a medium speed on the right wheel. The left wheel is either faster than the right wheel or slower than the right wheel, depending on the set of the sensor sees white or black. That way you've got a robot that hunts around that black line. You could make it better by having proportional control. So you could, rather than seeing if the sensor just sees black or white, you could say, well, let's look at the proportion of light that the sensor sees. And if this, the, the left wheel speed is proportional to the amount of light that the sensor sees, so if the sensor sees half black, half white, keep that the left wheel at a medium speed, and always keep the right wheel at a, a fixed medium speed as well. So if it's on the line, or if it's on the, the right-hand side of the line, it should be going straight. If it veers to the right, so the sensor sees more white, then that would slow down the left wheel, which would make it veer back towards the line. And if the, the, line start, if the sensor starts to see more black, then it would speed up the left wheel which makes it veer away from the line. So you've got that hunting, that following, which is exactly what you do when you're driving along the motorway. You're looking at the hard shoulder. If you're drifting too close to the hard shoulder, you just turn your wheel slightly to the right and you're drifting away, and vice versa. So you, you, you're constantly hunting when you drive. You're hunting all the time anyway. You don't just keep the wheels straight. Otherwise, you could just tie a bungee cord around it and read the paper, couldn't you? But we constantly have to correct ourselves. Exactly the same with the robots. If you want to relate it more to your challenge, then um, perhaps an ultrasonic sensor can be used to look at the distance to a wall or to objects, and it's constantly changing and hunting to keep that object or the wall at a certain distance if it has to be wall following. Or if you're following lots of um, spikes in the ground, turn those into a wall and then follow that wall, just as you would with a line. So you're hunting away and towards the line, but you will never completely follow that line. You will be having to make some sort of adjustments. Something that will also relate to your robot challenge is known as state programming. So what we've got is our sensors of our robot, and we've got our actuators. And in the robot, just as in a person, we have different states. So uh, the most immediate state might be avoid collisions. Another state might be find light, follow light, or build maps. So these are going into higher cognitive states. And it's just like we do in town. Okay, so you're walking around town. You've got your sensors and your actuators, your, your feet. Okay, and it's your navigation, it's your orientation, which is the most important. The most important bit is avoid collisions. Depending on if you're hungry or not, you might have a state that might be find a cafe or find a pub. As you're walking, you're also building a, bit, a map of the area. You remember where you've been and you're taking landmarks. So we work very similar, well, the robots, 
rather, were very similar to us. So state programming, here's an example, and I've, I've, I've put it onto the, the, the other challenge, but it, it equally relates to you. And I've put some uh, pickaxe code here as well. So, for example, a state might be waiting for the start button. So at the start of your robot challenge, it's got a, the robot is waiting for the button to be pressed. You press the button, and then it moves towards a particular point. Now, it might be moving towards the first object, so the first state might be scan to find object location, found object location, and then the state after that might be drive towards that object location while scanning. Once it's gone to the first object location, and it says, yes, I'm, I'm within 10 centimeters of the object, move into another state, so that might be state three. So move to the, the ramp or another object. So, uh, and then the next state might be state four, not necessarily moving, it might be uh, move up ramp until I, uh, the incline has changed. So then you start to, the robot decides to suddenly read the um, inclinometers so it knows where it is. So different states will also focus on different sensors, just as, you know, if you're hungry, you're focusing on your stomach. If you're avoiding collisions, you're focusing on, on which direction you're facing. So the same with robots, you can have many sensors, but you only need to use certain sensors at certain times, depending on the, set, on the state that you're in. Another state might be just turn 180 degrees. I know that's one in your challenge, where you, if you found an object, then turn around 180 degrees, and then the state after that might be search for the next object in, in range. Once you found that object, you go into the next state. So state programming is, is really the way forward with robots. So how would you do that with a pickaxe? Well, what you can do is have a variable holding a state. In this example, I've said B0. And there is an error here, I must say. That B0 equals 1 should be above name. Otherwise, it's always going to be equal to 1. So apologies for that. That should be above name. But imagine it's above name. So B0, which is a state, is equal to 1 to start off with. And then this is the main program. It's not it's a short program, um, and it's just full of go subs to subroutines, okay? And really, the main program is just sending the program to the particular state that it needs to be. Okay, so it starts off with state is one, then go sub state one, okay? Seems a bit silly, but let's go to state one. And then this is just looking and waiting for the button to be pressed, so it says, if pin B0 equals 1, let's say that the button is connected to pin B0, okay, then let B0 equal 2. So in other words, let the state equal the next state. So it goes from state 1, from waiting for the start button, to state 2, doing something else. And that's the only thing that it changes. So it keeps your program nice and simple. You've got a return, so what return does is it returns it back to this program code. So the the main program code is just going around in an infinite loop, and all it's doing is monitoring the states. So return takes it back to after the go sub, but that's irrelevant really, as long as it's back in this main loop as the main thing. So this state is now 2, so now it says if B0 equals 2, then go sub state 2. So let's have a look at the state 2. Okay, what I've got here is the state handling bit, and it says go sub set line follow. So this is just a line following example. So it's moving from here, from A to point E. So go sub line follow. Line follow is just a procedure that you might use several times. It might be follow the point that you see with the ultrasonic sensor, but because you use it several times, you may as well put it into a function. The more functions you make, the easier your code is to recycle, to use several times, and also to follow. So if you're working as a group, this is really important to keep it nice and straightforward. And if you're working as a group as well, I would suggest that you can, you can work on these separately. So for example, set line follow is a function that somebody could just test in separately while someone else is working on something, another part of the project. Someone could say, right, I'm gonna make a line following procedure. And you could just write that as a code and the robot just follows a line. Once you know that works, you can then cut and paste it into your big main program. And that becomes just a, a state of the robot. 
So it's following the line. Um, you can have your line following code, as I mentioned. It can turn the steering wheel or the, or the speed of the left and right wheels, depending on what the sensor sees. Um, and eventually it needs to escape from this state. So set line follow. Um, actually, that could all it could do is just set the speed of the motors and it can return. It returns back to the state 2 holder and it says if pin B1 equals 1, then let state equals 3. Now, this is a, another example of how do you exit from a state. So it's set in the line follow and all it does is set the steering and it can exit that bit of code because it doesn't matter, it's still following the line because it will still get called lots of times anyway and this is looking for B1 equals 1 so B1, pin B1 could be a sensor let's say that detects a junction so that is how it would escape from state number 2 it would follow a line until a sensor on B1 might see a junction it says, ah, I'm changing my state now and if the state is was 2 and it sees a junction, then let the state equal 3 and then do something else. But while it, before it sees that junction, it will be moving along and you can see that the program code, well that's not true, B1 is equal to 0, so it returns back up to the main code, which loops around, and it still gets sent off to state 2. State 2 cut says, go some line follow, line follow, it will reset the, the steering angle. So the, the program is moving from the main to state 2, and it says, oh yes, well state 2 is line follow, goes to line follow, returns, returns, and carries on. All of this happens so quickly that it doesn't matter that it's not all in one piece of code that's moving like that. Even though it's being called in different locations, it doesn't make any difference. So I really recommend that that is how to set out your code. Not one big long line of stuff, right, now I'm following the line, and that, that's a, a code of page like that. Now I'm uh, looking for the ultrasonic sensor. If it's all in one piece of, it's all in, if it's all in one main, it's very hard to follow. But if it's separate like this, different people can work on different parts of the code and then bring it together. So it's just, from my experience of programming, this is, it seems a bit of a strange way of doing it, but really, and it, and it seems long-winded, but for a computer it doesn't make any difference. That return, where does it go to when, it's, when that returns? Yeah, okay, that's, that's a really good question. So, glad you asked that. So the, the real power of micro, or any computer system is go sub and return. And go sub and return means that it has a little memory of where it was last time. And you can have as many go subs and as many returns as you like, and it remembers all of those places. So, when B0, look at the main, B0 is equal to 2, then go sub state 2. When it comes to go sub, it says, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remember where I was. It's a bit like putting a bookmark in, right? I'm going to remember that bit, go sub state 2. It goes to state 2, okay, and then he says, ah, go sub, line follow. So I'm going to put bookmark number 2 there. So it's got two bookmarks, and that's fine. You can have a thousand bookmarks if you like, and computers often do. So it goes to the set line follow. It does this bit of code. When it sees return, it says, okay, what bookmark was I at? Oh yes, I was at bookmark number two. I look at bookmark two, so I'll, I'll, it's called popping it off the stack, actually. You push it and you pop it. So it returns, so it says, ah yes, I was at bookmark number two, so I've gone to the next line. So it comes here. Uh, that if, if pin B dot 1, okay, we'll forget that because it's not true yet, return. What bookmark am I at? Oh yes, now I, I was at bookmark number 2, but now I'm at bookmark number 1. So I'll pop that off the stack. Where was I? Ah, oh, yes. So, just after that go sub. So that's how it works. You can have as many nested go sub and returns. The one problem you've got to watch out for is you always need to have a go sub and a return matched up. If you have several go subs, but you forgot to put a return, you put a go to instead, you can have a big problem because you have a memory leak because it's putting all those bookmarks on, but they're never being popped back off the stack. They're being pushed onto the stack, but not popped off. So you'll, eventually you'll get an, an error. And it, but the problem is it might take a few minutes for that error to become apparent because as it's running, it's slowly pushing up that stack of bookmarks until it runs out of bookmarks. So you will get an error. Also, if you have a return without a go sub, there's no bookmarks, what do I do? 
um, it will throw up an error as well. So you've just got to be careful of your matching each one of those. Okay, so everything is the main code. It's always nice to keep it nice and straightforward, and that is just going off to the states. The state is a label, and there always needs to be some way of changing one state to another. You might be able to, you know, you, you could have different options in state two. You could either go back to state one or state three or state four. It doesn't matter. It doesn't always have to be that linear. You can have one state which might be line follow. One state might be look for an object. Another state might be climb up the ramp. Another state might be uh, move forward until inclin inclination is a certain value. So they're all states. So just bear that in mind when you're programming and, and see how it develops. I think you'll find that that really does make, um, make the code a lot easier to work with. And if you're working as a group, it's important because they might say, well, what, what is the robot doing? And then you can debug. If you debug V0, you can see what state your robot's in. What is it doing? Why is it just stood there? Well, if I do a debug, I can see what it's doing. It might be waiting for the button. Um, and as I've said, you can, you can also develop bits of code separately. Another example might be you either, you either get line, set line follow separately and run that as, a, as a, an individual state. Say, all right, I've got it working now. Great, cut and paste it into your main code. But another thing might be, prior to the, doing the robot challenge, I know there's a lot of states for your robot. It's waiting for the button. It's, it's trying to find the first object. It's trying to get up the next object, etc. But if you want to test your robot quickly and you just want to test your robot on the ramp, you can either have the program separate or up here you could say B0 equals 5. So if 5 is, is going up the ramp, you could say, OK, um, all I'm going to change is B0 equals 5. Uh, I'm going to now put the robot before the ramp and, uh, and let it run. So the robot thinks it's been all the way around and it's got to that particular state. So it's a good way of jumping the gun. So rather than having to have the robot go through the whole thing, just try it on different parts. Right, I'm going to try this particular state. All you need to do is change that value and then set your robot going and see if it can do that particular bit. And then you can tick the box. So it's a good way of testing different ideas. We do that when the robot's got to test the headlands. You know, you can't have the robot go around three tram lines and then have it turning on a particular headland. We, we put it to that headland, put it into that state, and then let it go. So, you know, it's, it's just about um, being a bit clever with your code. Really. Okay, so just the last section that I want to talk about, which is the research that we're currently doing, is, is SLAM and using sensors for location. So the robot system can have uh, an X and Y coordinate system. It doesn't really matter which way around it is, as long as you always use the same method, basically. As long as you use the same coordinate system, and that your trigonometry works out nicely. So the blue bit is the robot. Let's say we've got a tree, and we want to know how much the robot has moved. So we can use an ultrasonic sensor. And the ultrasonic sensor can scan around and view an object and it's around. So it sees a, an object and says, OK, at 45 degrees, measured a distance. So we can calculate the position of that object by using trigonometry. Distance times cos 45 is on the x direction and the same on the y direction. Okay? So it knows what the object is. So if the robot moves forwards, See that it's moved forward slightly and taken another scan. So now it would say, perhaps at 80 degrees, I measured an object at distance, 23 centimetres. So the position of the object is X and Y. But has the object moved or has the robot moved? Well, in an agricultural situation where there's no sheep in the field, we're going to assume that it's the robot that's moved and not the sheep. Okay. So this, the robot says, OK, well, I can see that that object has moved slightly. And it must be the same object because it's only moved by a few centimetres. So the object seems to have moved, but really I've moved. So you can see how many, move, how many centimetres the, the robot has moved, and, and indeed if it's rotated as well. So this is the, the localization part of it. But what it's also doing is mapping as well. So it's mapping the object and it's localising itself. 
How does a robot know to avoid objects and obstacles? How does it know the best way around? Now, you might recall, I think we did a lecture maybe last year, where I spoke about path planning. Remember this kind of thing, where we, we have a, a matrix of values. So, if I just remind you, we divide the area into one meter square grids that the robot can move. So, every time the robot can move, we say it moves by one meter. It just keeps life nice. And the robot is decide which coordinate, which value to move. Does it go to the left of the trees or to the right of the trees? So it can divide all of this area into one meter squares. And then it starts off by sensing ah, there's objects in the way. So it can put a high number into the grid. It says, OK, well, at two meters away, I've seen an object and another object. So I'm going to put a high number in there. I'll just put 255 in. It's just a high number. It doesn't really matter which value it is. Okay, now I can't see behind that object, so I've got another high number. All of these numbers are zero to start off with because there's nothing in there. And then what the robot does in its mind is it says, okay, well I need to be at this point here, I need to be carrying on the line. I need to be over here, behind the trees. So I'll put the number one in there. You might remember this from last year. And then the path planning algorithm kicks in and it says, okay, I'm going to start off with any val any of these boxes that has a number one in. There's only one, okay? And every number, every box, sorry, that's next to that, I'm going to put the next number in. So I'll put twos next to that, as long as it's not got a high number in. So as long as it's got a zero, I'll put the next higher number. And then for all the twos, I'll put the next higher number. So we've got a three. Let that can spread on, on to the left and to the right. Next to the two, I've got a three. I've got a three there. Next to all the threes, I've got a four. Next to all the fours, I'll put a five. Next to the fives, I'll put a six. Next to the sixes, I'll put a seven. And then you say, okay, well, where, where am I when I did this measurement? Oh, yes, I'm at this value, number six. <coughs> How do I get around the trees? I always go to the next square, which is a lower number. So I'll go to this square, five. Now I'll go this way, north, four. Three, two, and then to the uh, west, one. And then carry on with the line following procedure. So that's how it can plan its most optimal route around. And this is assuming, of course, that the robot moves in one meter squares. It doesn't always have to, but we can just put an, uh, an aim point, if you like, within the centimeter of these squares. Where do I aim for? I'll aim for the five. Now where do I aim for? I'll aim for the three, the four, the three, the two, and the one. You can do diagonals as well, but this is just the, the simple way of path planning. So that hopefully brings it back round to you know, how we um, do some path planning and how we localise objects. And the SLAM, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, says, well, if I can scan lots of objects like this, let me keep a table of each of the objects. So I said the first object I'm, I saw was object one, the next one, two, three, and four. Okay, I've done a scan. Great. Object one, two, three, and four. What are the coordinates? So I've mapped out those, those values. And as I move forwards, some of the objects might not be visible anymore, like number four. That doesn't matter. I still keep that in my memory for later on because I might be back this direction later on. So I've built up that map. But I can see another object, number five. Great. So I'll put that into my table. And that's the, the coordinates of my, row, of my object, object number five. So as I move around, I can see how the object is changing with respect to the robot motion and therefore calculate how much I'm moving. So I'm localising myself. So that is the essence of SLAM. And that's really the, what we're working on, what the world is working on in robotics, in mobile robotics, is, is working on these SLAM procedures. So the simultaneous localisation and mapping. If you, want, if you want to need, know some more, all of these are online anyway, so you can always cut and paste these uh, web addresses. Um, the SLAM is, is quite good. Um, navigation, where am I? It's quite a beefy document. It tells you all about robot navigation and localization. If you want that UTM conversion bit of code, it does work with an Arduino. Um, don't know if it'll work with a pickaxe. Look, at, you're not using GPS with your, your challenge anyway, but later on, if you use an Arduino or something else, you can cut and paste that and uh, 
got the results.